Hi, my name is Chris and this is Battle Nonsense. If you just watched the netcode analysis and followed my advice to check out this video first or right after the netcode analysis, then I would like to thank you. Because the basic information about computer networks, the so-called netcode, the factors that have an impact on your online experience, as well as how I test the netcode, might be critical to understand the results that I show you in the actual netcode analysis of a multiplayer game. Previously, I did include this information in every netcode analysis video, but due to popular demand, I have decided to try and keep this information separate from the netcode analysis to reduce the length of these videos. However, you will always find a card overlay as well as a link in the description of every future netcode analysis video, which points to this video here, so you can find it easily if you want to. So let's dive into the networking basics then, where we will start with the ping. Now, what is that and where does the term come from? If you've seen the movie The Hunt for Red October, then you might remember that scene where Sean Connery gave the order to use a single active sonar ping to re-verify their range to the target. The way this works is that your ship or submarine sends out an audio signal, which then gets reflected by other objects in the water. This reflection is then received by microphones or hydrophones installed on your ship. And that then allows you to determine the distance between you and that object by measuring the time between sending the audio signal and receiving the reflection. So when we talk about network connections, then the ping between different devices is pretty much the same thing. Your device sends an ICMP echo request to another network device like a game server, which then sends an ICMP echo reply back to your device. When we then measure the time between sending the request and receiving the answer, then we get the ping or round trip time of the data. So the ping tells us how long data has to travel through the copper and fiber optic cables to reach the other device. And the longer it takes data to reach its destination, the greater the difference between what we see on our monitor and what the other players see on theirs, which is what we call lag. So when I jump, then it takes some time until that information reaches the server and then the other client. With short distances and good routing between the players and the server, this delay or lag is very low. However, the bigger the distance between the clients and the server, the longer it will take until these receive an update on what is happening. So the higher your ping, the more you will lag, which means that you have a bad experience. But it's not just the player with the high ping that suffers. Depending on how strong the lag compensation is in a game, the player with the high ping can also degrade the experience of players who have a low ping, as these then either receive damage far behind cover or get shot before they can even see the player with the high ping. Developers have tried many different solutions to fix or at least mitigate this issue. Some have tried to use a region lock, but that does not work as network congestion can cause your ping to go from a stable 20 milliseconds to 300 milliseconds at any time. So what can be done? The brute force solution is to disconnect players who have a ping high enough to cause that issue. However, that will hurt your sales and communities which have members across the globe. DICE uses a quite interesting approach to attack this issue in Battlefield 1, which I want to show you now. Here we have a player with a ping of about 47 milliseconds, let's call him player 1. And then we got the shooter, player 2, who has a ping of about 147 milliseconds. When player 2 now fires at player 1, then the client of player 2 will run the hit registration, which figures out that player 1 has been hit. The client of player 2 then sends this information to the server, which runs its own check to confirm the hit. When the server agrees, then it sends the hit confirmation back to player 2 and the damage data to player 1. This form of hit registration is called client-side server authoritative, because while the client does the hit registration, the server must still confirm the hit or no damage will be dealt. When I then slightly increase the ping of player 2 to about 157 milliseconds, then player 2 gets the aim lead indicator, which tells him that his ping to the server is too high. When player 2 now fires at player 1 again, then the hit will not register anymore, because the hit registration now changed from client-side server authoritative to fully server-side. But when player 2 then leads his shot, which means that he just has to fire a little bit earlier, then the shot registers again. This allows player 2 to still hit other players while not making the issue of receiving damage behind cover worse. So once the ping of player 2 is higher than the configured threshold, his hit registration switches from client-side server authoritative to fully server-side, where the server won't compensate for the delay of player 2. 
This means that the only perspective that now matters is the one from the server and where he sees player 1 when it receives the information about the shot that player 2 fired. This is how DICE tries to mitigate the issue where players with low pings die far behind cover while still allowing players from all over the world to come together and play their game. Now, what affects your ping to the game server or your lag in general? One factor that you already know of is the distance between you and the game server. However, it is not possible to determine your ping by taking a map and drawing a straight line between your home and the location where the server is hosted. Because the copper and fiber optic cables take a very different route and the data that you send to the server has to pass through multiple routers before it reaches the server. So when a router has to forward data, then it tries to use the best route. This means that when everything works as it should, then your data should take the shortest route to the game server. However, it can happen that a router either chooses a bad route or that it has to choose a worse one when the better one is down. Such can then lead to quite big detours for your data, which can also result in much higher pings and an increased risk of packet loss, since your data might have to pass through many more routers then. So when you suddenly notice a much higher ping to your favorite server, then this could be caused by the routing. In this case, you will then have to call your internet service provider so that they can check their routing tables. If you want to get the issue fixed faster, then you can provide them with traceroute data for that server. For that, you open the command prompt, type in tracert and the IP of the game server that you have problems with. You will then get a list of all the hops between you and the game server with the ping between you and each of these hops. However, please be aware that depending on its configuration, a hop might not reply to your ICMP echo request or with a greater delay. The same is true for game servers where many do not reply when you try to ping them from the command prompt. So the length of the route that connects the client to the server and the amount of hops between them affects how long it takes data to reach its destination. This means that the lag that we experience in a game can never be lower than the travel time of the data, unless we figure out a way to break the laws of physics to speed up the electrons or photons that are used for the communication between the client and the server. What adds an extra delay on top of the travel time of our data is how frequently we send and receive it. So when we send and receive 30 updates per second, then there is more time between updates than when we send and receive 60. So by sending and receiving more updates per second, you can decrease the additional delay that is added on top of the travel time of your data. But low update rates do not only affect the network delay. They can even cause issues like super bullets, where a player takes too much damage from what appeared to be a single hit. Let me explain why this happens. Let's say that the game server sends just 10 updates per second, like many Call of Duty games do when a client is hosting the match. At this update rate we have 100 milliseconds between the data packets, which is the same time that we have between two bullets when a gun has a firing rate of 600 rounds per minute. So at an update rate of 10 Hz we have one packet per fired bullet as long as there is no packet loss and as long as the gun has a firing rate of not more than 600 rounds per minute. But many shooters, including Call of Duty, have guns which fire 750 or even more rounds per minute. And so we then have two or more bullets per update. This means that when two bullets hit a player, then the damage of these two hits will be sent in a single update. And so the receiving player will get the experience that he got hit by a super bullet that dealt more damage than a single hit from this gun is able to deal. So this should explain why we do not only need the high update rates to reduce the delays, but also to get a consistent online experience as a little bit of packet loss is less of an issue then. Now, where's the data coming from that is sent by the server and the clients? This is where the term tick or simulation rate comes into play, which is how many times per second the game processes and produces data. So when you have a tick or simulation rate of 60, then this will cause less delay than when you use a tick rate of 30. A tick rate of 60 will also allow the server to send 60 updates per second. But not only the number of simulations that are done per second is important. It's also critical that the server finishes a tick as fast as possible, because at a tick rate of 60 Hz it only has a processing window of 16.66 milliseconds, inside which it must finish a simulation step. So at the beginning of a new tick, the server starts to process the data it received and runs its simulations. After that it then sends the results to the clients and then sleeps until the next tick happens. 
The faster the server finishes a tick, the earlier the clients will receive new data from the server, which reduces the delays between players and makes the hit registration feel more responsive. This is something that I showed in my Battlefield 4 tests where the netgraph displays the time the server needs to finish a tick. So when it comes to the server's performance, then it's imperative that it finishes a simulation step as fast as possible, or at least inside the processing window that is given by the tick rate. When it gets close to that limit or even fails to process a tick inside that time frame, then you will instantly notice this as that results in all sorts of strange gameplay issues like rubber banding, players teleporting, hits getting rejected, physics failing, etc. Now what kind of options do developers have when it comes to the network model? One solution is that you pay hosters to set up dedicated servers for your games in their data centers to which the players then connect to. This means that your game server is running on powerful hardware and the data center has enough bandwidth to handle all those players that connect to it. Also when the matchmaking makes sure that all players have more or less the same ping to the game server, then you can avoid that some players have an unfair advantage in some situations or give players with low pings a bad experience. The downside of dedicated servers is that if you don't have a game that builds around the idea of the community running these servers, then the publisher or studio has to pay for them and they are quite expensive. Another challenge is that if you release your game worldwide, then you must also make sure that all players who buy the game have access to low latency servers. If you do not do that, then you create many players with high pings and that is a problem for your entire community, not just the players who don't have servers near them. A different approach which many people falsely refer to as peer-to-peer -peer, is that you simply use the PC or console of one of the players to host the game, which means that he essentially becomes the server. With this solution the game studio does not have to pay for expensive dedicated servers. And it also allows players located in a remote region to play with their friends at relatively low latency. One of the many downsides that this network model is suffering from is that the player who is also the server gets an advantage, because he has zero lag. This causes that he will see you before you see him and he can fire at you before you can fire at him. Then we also have the problem that all players connect to the host through his consumer grade internet connection, when the worst case he could even use Wi-Fi. This frequently results in a lot of lag, packet loss, rubber banding and an unreliable hit registration. But the most infuriating part of such a client hosted match is the host migration, which is the process where the whole game pauses for several seconds while a different player is elected to replace the host that just left. Then we got the peer-to-peer -peer network model which you mostly see in 1v1 fighting games, but there are also a few other multiplayer games that have more than two players which use peer-to-peer. -peer. And since there are different variations of this network model, I will use For Honor as a reference in this explanation. So in this network model we do not have a dedicated game server, nor is a client elected to host the match and run the simulation. However we at least need a session host which takes care of invites and handshakes. That could be done by a dedicated server or like in For Honor a client is used for that task, which is also why the game will pause for several seconds until a new session host has been elected should the previous one leave. Another downside is that because every client runs its own simulation, the responsiveness of the hit registration might also vary depending on the ping of the player you engage. So when you fight a player to which you have a ping of 5 milliseconds, then the hit registration might feel better than when you engage a player to which you have a ping of 148 milliseconds. Or players with a high ping make the hit registration less responsive in general as the clients keep their simulation in sync. Probably the biggest downside of this network model is security, as every game client knows and sees the WAN IP addresses of the other players. Besides that, there are a few other concerns that this peer-to-peer -peer network model has in common with client-hosted matches. Like the impact of underpowered hardware used by the players, as well as the players consume a great internet connection as all clients talk to each other to keep their simulation in sync. And anti-cheat is also always a very big concern in games that do not have an authoritative game server. So even though dedicated game servers do not magically provide 100% lag free connections, I believe that they offer the best possible experience in online multiplayer games where you have more than two players participating in a match. Now before I show you how I measure the network delay in an online multiplayer game, I want to talk about one more factor that has a significant impact on your online experience. Packet loss. 
The internet is not just slow in terms of how long a single bit must travel to reach its destination, there is also not really a guarantee that a data packet will reach its destination. And when a packet disappears then this is called packet loss and it's obviously bad, especially in games that have low update rates where every data packet counts. So what causes packet loss? The issue could already be caused inside of your PC or your console by a faulty network interface or broken drivers. In case that you use Wi-Fi or Powerline, interference or congestion can cause packet loss as well. So can a broken network port or network cable. Packet loss can also be caused by your router when it has a firmware issue, a hardware problem or when you are running out of upstream or downstream bandwidth which can cause that packets get dropped. What might help here is a firmware upgrade, a simple power cycle of the router or in case that your issues are caused by someone else maxing out your entire up or downstream bandwidth, you might want to invest in a router which prioritizes data from real time applications like the Edge Router X from Ubiquiti can. If packet loss happens outside of your home network then you can only run a tracer, which I explained earlier, to find the hop where the packet loss occurs and then forward this information to your internet service provider. Now how do I measure the delay that two players are affected by in a multiplayer game? To test this I use a high speed camera, two PCs where each of them has its own fiber internet connection and the 144Hz gaming monitor on which the game runs at more than 144fps with all graphic options set to the lowest value. To measure the delays between the players I point my high speed camera at the monitors and then have player 2 shoot 20 times at player 1. Inside the high speed recording I then look for the frame where I see that player 2 starts to fire and then I count the frames until I see that the damage was received by player 1, which is indicated by either blood splatter, a damage indicator or the update of the health indicator depending on what happens first and what is available in the game. In addition to this damage delay test I also check the delay of the gunfire animation as well as the movement delay. And this brings us to the end of this video, so congratulations you have completed the battle nonsense netcode crash course, which means that you are well prepared to engage in discussions about networking in online multiplayer games and you won't have any problems when you watch one of my netcode analysis videos. So I hope that you enjoyed this little crash course and if you like my in-depth netcode and input lag tests where I show you how these affect your gaming experience then you can help to cover the costs of this channel by supporting me on Patreon. Without the support of my patrons I really could not continue to bring you this kind of content as the ad revenue generated on YouTube is not even enough to pay the Adobe Creative Cloud subscription at the end of the month. So if you want to support me as well then you can find the link in the description down below. Also if you want to stay up to date on what I'm currently working on then you can follow me on Twitter or Facebook, the links are also in the description of this video. And if you don't want to miss the next one then you might want to subscribe to my channel and click on the little bell icon below this video to receive a notification when I upload the next one. So if you enjoyed this video then please give it a like, subscribe for more and I hope to see you next time. Until then have a nice day and take care. My name is Chris and this was Battle Nonsense.